a devastating explosion in Beirut. What's happening in Lebanon and what's happening in missiology? It's gangbusters right now. We're hitting the streets and God is doing amazing work, but it's just incredibly heartbreaking to see the amount of destruction and the amount of up to 300,000 people that are now homeless because of this explosion that was right off the urban area of Beirut. Pierre Rashad Hosni, Middle East North Africa Director for Horizons International, coming up on today's show. But first, a message from ABWE President Paul Davis. ABWE missionaries are coming beside the lost and the hurting around the world. And through the Global Gospel Fund, they're pulling people from the darkness and training them as leaders. They're planting churches, and they're even beginning their own missions movements. You may already support one ABWE missionary. Would you consider a gift to the Global Gospel Fund to support all 1,000 of our missionaries? Thank you for that. Become a partner today at abwe.org slash global gospel fund. Welcome to the Missions Podcast, the show that explores your hard questions on missions, theology, and practice to help goers think and thinkers go. I'm Alex Kochman, Director of Advancement and Mobilization for ABWE International, joined again by Scott Dunford, West Coast Mobilizer with ABWE and Lead Church Planter for Redeemer Church in Fremont, California. Now, Scott, uh, as we record here, it's a Monday for us, probably a Monday for many of our listeners by the time that they get uh, to hearing this episode. It was just a few short days ago um, that you and I, I, I imagine we both saw the news break on Twitter, scrolling our feeds, and this viral video um, is spreading all over the world of not one, mm-hmm. but two massive uh, cataclysmic uh, explosions in Beirut, Lebanon. Um, I just felt just this ghastly horror yeah. come over me uh, seeing that. Uh, and knowing individuals who've, uh, who are either from Lebanon uh, or who, who have done ministry there, what was your reaction seeing that? I, you know, for, for whatever reason, probably because we know so many uh, people from Lebanon and have so many Lebanese friends, it, it seems like things that happen in Beirut seem to hit closer to the American heart than, than things that happen in most places in the world. And, you know, first of all, seeing that cloud, which, you know, it looked like a mushroom cloud at first, you know, and uh, and then watching the videos and then as news started trickling in from friends and connections. And we have a couple in our church and he's from Lebanon and I've got friends, you know, we the friend of the show, Lena Abu Jamra and others, you know, hearing their mm. their reports of what's happening on the ground. And even there was one video that I saw that really hit me. And it's uh, just a bride taking wedding photos. And uh, and while the the blast itself wasn't caught on shot. The the like the wind, the aftershock that blew her dress and knocked everything down. It just it put into start. It, it hits hmm. you hard emotionally because you realize these are just a day in the life of most people. And and then everything changes. Mm. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm working on a writing project right now, and um, it's missions related. Going through Psalm chapter two, and you see those first few verses there, just about the nations raging. It is a reminder that as we engage in the missionary task, that it is a crazy world that we're going out to engage. Uh, It's wartime. It's not peacetime spiritually um, as well as physically. But we want to dive into all of that with a guest that I had had the privilege uh, earlier in the week of uh, interacting with um, just by happenstance. Somebody had reached out to me from his organization, and I think God was connecting the dots for us here. We're going to be speaking today with Pierre Husni, uh, who is a Lebanese American who grew up in the context of cross-cultural ministry among Muslims and international students. He's now the Middle East North Africa Regional Director for Horizons International, and they're based in Beirut. Uh, Pierre has traveled to over 30 countries. He has his field experience in the Middle East, and he uh, began uh, even as a teenager spending summers there doing outreach in Lebanon as a teenager, um, doing a gap year there. He co-edited the book Engaging Islam. He writes extensively for biblicalmissiology.org, fantastic website we'll get talking about a little bit later into the program. Uh, He trains Arab and Western Christians for effective ministry to Muslims, and he's active in missiological advocacy among the global missions community. So, you know, we'd love to hear, tell us a little bit about yourself, Pierre, and um, can you just give your impressions of how it hit you last week and what what are you hearing is going on on the ground there in Beirut? Sure. Thank you, Scott and Alex, uh, both, you know, for having us 
it's just, um, this has been a really heartbreaking week for, for all of us. And it's amazing how many people around the world have just, uh, just poured out their, uh, their love and care for Lebanon right now. Uh, I'm a person, you know, as you mentioned, I grew up in the United States as a Lebanese American. And, uh, so I've, I've kind of, my role in ministry is really, uh, in being a bridge, bridging the gap between, uh, the community of, uh, of Christ in, uh, in the Middle East and the rest of the world, particularly uh, the United States. So kind of being in that third culture position, kind of understanding the, the worldview of the Middle East and also understanding the worldview and mentalities and how to communicate with Westerners, that's put me at a crossroads uh, or, you know, as kind of a bridge, uh, a communicational bridge. And so I've kind of found my calling in, uh, in supporting national, you know, indigenous workers uh, as well as incorporating missionaries from around the world, both the United States, China, and other places, uh, into those fully functioning teams on the ground. Um, and uh, so the way that this has impacted our team is just so profound. Thankfully, our team, of uh, we have about 85 staff uh, on the ground in Lebanon. Thankfully, we only had one injury uh, during the blast. But a lot of people's homes were affected. We had a lot of glass blown out uh, of all of our facilities in in Beirut. Uh, our other centers, obviously, in other places in the country, are fine. Um, but this uh, this has really been the third of three crises crises that have just uh, rocked Lebanon. The first being the the protests protests the political uh, turmoil that brought the economy to its knees back in October. And that's when uh, inflation started uh, happening with the currency. And then the second one, you know, after a hundred days of continuous political protest and violence, uh, went into uh, COVID lockdown, which further brought the economy, you know, just pushed it flat on its back. And then now, after a hundred days of lockdown, approximately, uh, and just people have been sliding further and further into destitution. Not only the you know, millions of Syrian refugees in the country, but also now the Lebanese, the middle class has just been knocked out mm. and they're all finding themselves in poverty. Yeah. Now, the last thing that we needed was this huge blast that just really knocked the hope out of Lebanese people. So for those who haven't seen the viral video or I've seen it, I will fully confess I haven't had a chance to to follow all of the reporting. What what happened? Was this an accident? Was this terror? Was this conspiracy? Is that not known or agreed upon right now? And once you're able to unpack this, how's this affecting your, your operations? I mean, has ministry stopped for you guys? Um, so those, those kind of two questions there. Sure. Yeah, well, there's uh, the jury's out as to what caused this. And uh, there are a lot of people that believe that it wasn't an accident. There are a lot of people who believe it was an accident, but either way, the responsible uh, parties are, you know, are the same. And this is widely believed to be, um, you know, we could say widely known to be a weapons stash of Hezbollah. And whether or not somebody hit it or whether there was negligence, I mean, there was definitely a lot of negligence. And whether somebody took advantage of that by hitting this weapons store, and there's a lot of speculation you know, maybe Israel hit that weapons store and hopefully they didn't know how much explosives were really in there. Because if they did know, um, you know, yeah. then that would be really a, a huge crime against humanity. If they didn't know, maybe they just thought that they were going to blow out some weapons and cause some damage to the port, but everything would be okay. But definitely, you know, people who believe that they say once Israel saw all the collateral damage, and the humanitarian disaster that that has taken place, they definitely distance themselves quickly from any responsibility. But uh, in terms of the way that this affects our ministry, uh, our teams are now fully out of lockdown. Uh, people do not care about the coronavirus anymore, um, <laughs> yeah. and and uh, all of our all of our team is just mobilized and out on the streets, passing out sandwiches, passing out food portions, mm. praying for people, visiting their homes assessing the damage. We're uh, helping out with repairs. And uh, we're also working through our network of local churches who are all sending volunteers. And we're putting the materials in their hands and they're going out. So it's right now, um, you know, it's gangbusters right now. We're hitting the streets 
and God is doing uh, amazing work, but it's just incredibly heartbreaking to see just the, the amount of destruction and the amount of, you know, up to 300,000 people that are now homeless because of this, oh in, this explosion that was right off the urban, uh, you know, packed urban area of Beirut. Yeah, I've heard from other friends, you know, just that like that is a place that, you know, when when visitors come into town, they often stay within blocks of where that blast Mm -hmm. went off. And so it was kind of just the heart of everything in Beirut. Absolutely. And and Scott, when you think about the fact that if this were 100 meters uh, in further toward the coast, if it would have been the next warehouse over, not that warehouse, but the next one, the, the, the casualties would have been hundreds higher. And if it was 200 or 300 meters closer to the city, the casualties would literally be in the thousands or tens, probably tens of thousands of, of just instant casualties. It's it's just hard to get your mind around. And especially in a city that I I think is well known uh, in America for just, you know, it's a beautiful city. I mean, I love going into Lebanese restaurants and often you'll see this beautiful mural of of what the city of Beirut was like, you know, in its heyday. And yet my, almost my entire life, I'm 43, 44, I can't remember now, 44 years old. And all I've ever heard of Beirut is just constant bombings and the Hezbollah issue. And, you know, the, the, you know, the, the wars that have gone on there. And, and yet this is a rich and vibrant, beautiful culture that is just experiencing one heartache after another. So, um, what, what I'd like to ask you now is, you know, what, when we think about gospel proclamation and the spread of the gospel and, and missions uh, as it relates to, to Lebanon, what, what do people need to know? Uh, how is that? Can you just give us a little bit of background and, and please feel free to any, anything else you feel like we need to know about what's happening in Lebanon right now with, as a result of all these crises kind of coming together at once. Um, please feel free to keep, you know, talking about that. But, but sure. I also would like to have our listeners understand a little bit more about, what is so unique about Lebanon? You know, is it, it's a unique place of history where you have, you know, uh, Christians and Muslims and uh, other ethnicities and other religions kind of coming together at one place. Uh, how has that contributed to the current situation there? Yeah, I mean, I think, like you said, a lot of people don't realize how many Christians are uh, existent in Lebanon. I mean, it's over one third of the population of Lebanon is Christians, and that's the highest proportion in the Middle East. And that has resulted in a uh, a level of religious freedom that doesn't exist elsewhere in the Middle East. And uh, even the Muslim population, that's maybe just, you know, under two thirds of the population is split between Shiite and Sunni with also some Druze which I don't know, you know, some people consider them Muslims, some people don't. But uh, the fact that there is no majority uh, really uh, causes some unique uh, opportunities and also challenges for Lebanon. So uh, there's really, there's no possibility for political domination by one party without using other parties to get, uh, to get their way. And that's really what has happened uh, with Hezbollah through the years is they've had this what's what's called a nibbling strategy where they nibble away at the different institutions of uh you know of society and government and they have used money uh and corruption you know kind of rings of corruption to to dominate the society but what uh you know so they have basically sunni traders and christian traders that uh that have you know betrayed their uh, their people in exchange for Hezbollah's money, and uh, and for that reason, they have been able to to you know basically put it, uh, a puppet government in place, mm-hmm. and that is the pu- you know the puppet government that just resigned. Uh, even today, they just announced the resigning of the uh, of the government that had come you know that had been formed in place of the last one that was mm-hmm. that was uh, put in place. But it's well known that even though it looks like the government resigned the people in power are still in power. You know why? Because it's really the power that's behind the government, which is Hezbollah. And it's, wow. it's well known that, you know, the president doesn't become the president without Hezbollah saying, even though he's a Christian and he yeah. has to be by law a Christian. And the prime minister who's Sunni, he doesn't sit in his seat without Hassan Nasrallah from, you know, the, the Hezbollah uh, lead guy saying that he can. And so 
really the uh, the puppet government has been removed, but there's still that grip of power. But the potential that is be- that is behind uh, these bars, you could say these metaphorical bars of oppression and uh, you know and just political uh, yeah, you could say oppression is is an amazing population of potential. And it's a for me, I'm a missions guy. So I see that there's missions potential that's tremendous in the Lebanese church. And when you look at the over 100 uh, evangelical congregations that are in Lebanon, and you look at the believers that are there, their potential for cross-cultural missions into near culture people, which is the entire Middle East and North Africa region and the Muslim world, it's incredible when you, you know, and what we've been doing as Horizons is we've been uh, we established the Middle East Center for World Missions in uh, in Beirut in 2019, and we've been sending, actually even before that, for five years, we've been sending Lebanese and Syrian missionaries to Tunisia, to Turkey, mm. to Jordan, to Egypt, and it's amazing to see what kind of an impact that they can make just hit the ground running versus if you bring uh, you know missionaries from a further, a more distant culture like uh, China or America how long it takes to get up to speed to even be able to share the gospel with a few people here and there. So the potential for the kingdom is huge. So I, I got a couple of follow-ups with that, and in, in, in I want you to clarify some things for me. So several years ago, as we were getting sure. ready to work with Muslims overseas, um, I, I, was, I, I was at a conference and I was talking to a, a Lebanese pastor, and he's pretty well known, but I'm not going to say his name online, but uh, he's, he's pretty well known in, at least in American churches for his work over there. And, and he was saying that, that on the streets, like he and Hezbollah guys can talk freely and it's not a lot of animosity. And this was back in like 2007. And, uh, he's like, it was mo- the, the issues are often more political than they are religious. Is that your experience? Do you, do you feel that same way? Or maybe has that changed over time where, he seemed to be viewing, if I'm understanding correctly, that Hezbollah was more of a political organization within Islam, more than a radical Islamic, you know, caliphate type of uh, thought process. Absolutely. And definitely uh, Hezbollah is, you know, is backed by the Iranian agenda. Mm. And, you know, you could say it's a, you know, it's a religious agenda. But honestly, even if you analyze the Quran, and you analyze Muhammad and his sayings, he was really a, quite a political guy. Mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, he, had a, he said a lot of things about God, but when, if you really look at what he was doing, he was building an army. He was building an empire. Yeah. He, was, uh, you know, he, was, he was very financially motivated and power motivated. And uh, in the same way, that's how Muslims operate. And I think uh, a lot of Christians around the world don't really get that about Islam. Yeah. They don't really understand that Islam is not a religion. It's a, it's a holistic system of, of life that is very political uh, in nature and very even financial in nature. Yes. And uh, I think we have a value in the West of kind of compartmentalizing, a little bit of a you know, separation of church and state. There is no separation mm. of church and state in Islam. And definitely uh, in in Lebanon, uh, Hezbollah. I would say their orientation is primarily political, not uh, not religious in nature. So along with that, and I, I don't want to put you on the spot, so I'm going to rephrase it in a question that you don't have to necessarily agree or disagree with it. But uh, <laughs> expert interviewer <laughs> but, uh, Scott Dunford here. <laughs> but but I, you know, at the same time, you know, as he he's talking and he's speaking to a bunch of pastors in Michigan, and of course. You know, American Christians are extremely pro-Israel. And so, and, and he knew that my interest in Muslims and, and obviously, and so mm-hmm. he, he and I, we stepped aside for a second. And I asked him, I said, you know, like, I realize the situation with Lebanon and Israel is very complicated, especially for Christians. Uh, you know, what, you know, what for is sure. your take? And he, he, he talked about how, you know, he, he had his house actually hit by an Israeli missile that got off course and hit his house and didn't explode. And so he's like, it's very complicated because Christians get caught in the crossfire between Hezbollah and and Israel all the time. And so his impression of Israel, even though he felt like he couldn't say it, uh, he, he felt like he couldn't say it from the pulpit because of the pro-Israel movement within a lot of Christianity, but he also or evangelicalism. But but he also 
had felt like his own feelings about the nation of Israel were extremely complicated. Is that is that common amongst I'm not going to put you on the spot, but is that common amongst uh, Lebanese Christians that they feel that kind of uh, they're in a tough situation there? Absolutely. There is that tension. And I think uh, I mean, I think it's very well. uh, Yeah, I don't know how to say it, but I but I think it's pretty ubiquitous among uh, people who have had to be a Christian in the Middle East for many years. Yeah, because your wife is a Palestinian uh, background Christian, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. She's a Palestinian background Christian and she loves, uh, you know, Israelis and Jews. And we we have, uh, you know, a great love for all people. And uh, and so it's definitely not the anti-Semitism I think that that a lot of people, um, you know, I guess a lot of people that are more Zionistically oriented, they think that anybody who's not a Zionist must be, uh, you know, an anti-Semite. But I think that the way that you know the perspective of Middle Eastern Christians toward Israel um, is uh, is a little bit different, and it's mm. difficult because sometimes when we say the word Israel, we mean different things. Yeah, right. And I think that when uh, when American evangelicals, you know, we we as Lebanese Christians. We get the feeling that when American evangelicals talk about Israel, we're not sure that it really means what they think it means. Yes. <laughs> yes. Because we're not sure that the New Testament. Romans, not all who are of Israel are Israel. Yes. Absolutely. So there's many different shades of meaning within what Paul is You know, when he when he says Israel in one sentence, it could mean this. When he says in it in another sentence, it clearly does not mean that same thing as it meant in the other sentence. So when we don't understand the nuances of, first of all, the Middle Eastern mind, and second of all, Middle Eastern culture, then when you see those five letters, Israel, and you see them on the map, you think, oh, that's the same exact thing. Whereas uh, it really, really requires a, you know, a better understanding, uh, and, and you really have to open the New Testament. Mm. Because when you when you open the New Testament and you just read what uh, you know what the New Testament says about Israel, then for us Middle Eastern believers, it's pretty simple. Yeah. It's really pretty simple, but it kind of gets complicated when you have all these other political factors at play. Yes, and there are ditches on both sides. There's ditches in the side of anti-Semitism for sure. There's also ditches on the side of Zionism. And it's important for the missionary to know that number one, you need to read these things through a new Testament lens, not just a a political lens or even Mm -hmm. a lens of Mm -hmm. a particular interpretive tradition. And number two, these aren't all strictly theological disputes, right? Islam is not just a, um, a a series of theological propositions. There's an entire political power complex in, in your part of the world that uh, is caught up together with that. And so I thank you for surfacing some of those things. We've got a lot more that we want to dive into with you. We'll do that real quick after this quick break. We'll be right back with Pierre Husting. Hi, I'm Scott Dunford, and I'd like to share with you about a new nonprofit ministry established to help churches, Christian schools, and other ministries protect children and prevent abuse. Rich Hamar from Church Law and Tax states, that the number one reason that drives churches to court is child sexual abuse. I can't think of anything more devastating to these lives, their families, and our witness before a watching world than sexual abuse that takes place in ministry. The traumatic impact often leaves the vulnerable not wanting anything to do with God or his people. Furthermore, as ministry leaders, our efforts toward evangelism, discipleship, and spiritual formation are not only neutralized, but shattered. Evangelical Council for Abuse Prevention was formed last year to help ministry leaders understand the complexities of child protection and abuse prevention. They are establishing standards in an accreditation program that will help verify that appropriate measures are in place at your church or ministry. Learn more about them and their good work at abuseprevention.org. Find a helpful and free assessment tool to help you see how you measure up in this area. Go to abuseprevention.org and click on the link for this resource assessment. Evangelical Council for Abuse Prevention Pray for them and follow along for this accreditation program coming soon. Brooks Buser, president of Radius International. I am here with Mark Dever, senior pastor at Capitol Hill Baptist and president of Nine Marks. When you go to a culture that's a different language than yours, you're ending up in a kind of majority language that's been reached. And there are other people still more hidden, and it's those people who are often almost entirely unreached. And they take more cross-cultural effort 
is there a way we can better train people to have more realistic expectations of what life is like in the kind of two steps away from my culture and be able to sustain family life with its normal difficulties there so that there can be a long years and even decades long witness in that culture. And it seems like Radius is set up to provide that training. Radius is about reaching unreached people groups. Go to radiusinternational.org, radiusinternational.org. And we're back with Pierre Husney of Biblical Missiology and also of Horizons International. And uh, first, uh, just uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Horizons and Biblical Missiology, those two um, uh, outreach efforts that you're a part of. Yes. Yeah, so Horizons International was founded by my father, George Husney, who's uh, he's, he's our founder and still our president. Um, I actually recently, I guess two years ago, was appointed as the executive director of, uh, of Horizons International. And I still, you know, I do that based out of Beirut, Lebanon, where I also act as the um, Middle East and North Africa uh, regional director. Um, so uh, Horizons really comes out of the passions and calling uh, and the callings of, uh, of the Lord on my dad. And so my dad, he's Lebanese. He, he uh, as a teenager, he was involved in church planting uh, in several congregations in North Lebanon, uh, just even before he, uh, you know, he ever saw the inside of a theological seminary. And then uh, he also uh, spent, you know, a decade and a half doing Bible translation uh, work, uh, establishing several Bible translations in Middle Eastern languages, uh, including his, uh, his most well-known work which is Kitab, Kitab al-Hayat, which it means uh, Book of Life. It's the first modern standard uh, Arabic uh, translation of the mm. Bible. Mm. And so uh, kind of, uh, and then we ended up in the, in the United States in the 80s because uh, we were unable to get back to Lebanon from Egypt where we were printing the Bible. Um, and so I was born uh, in the United States. Uh, and we started doing cross-cultural ministry through the campuses on the United States, um, you know, where there's lots of internationals. So all of that culminated in 1990 in my dad uh, establishing Horizons. And so part of that, uh, you know, part of Horizons is the field ministry on the ground with Muslims. And then another part of our ministry is, is a training ministry, which uh, we have the Engaging Islam training curriculum. We've trained over 2,000 uh, uh, Western missionaries and just tens of thousands of uh, indigenous missionaries for reaching out to Muslims uh, through those curricula. And then an also, another offshoot of that is biblical missiology. Now, biblical missiology is, uh, is kind of, in a way, a response to uh, a lot of the Western trends in missionary mm. uh, thought, which is that uh, a lot of the missionary thought comes out of an anthropological uh, point of view. Yes. So basically taking the social uh, sciences as they have developed in the, you know, in the modern age in, uh, in the West and kind of taking advantage of those with a mission's intent. Mm -hmm. um, so, but we kind of have taken some bad turns uh, when we're doing that because we're, we're unknowingly sometimes accepting some of the presuppositions of, uh, you know, of the social sciences. One of the most dangerous ones is that there isn't anything called sin. Mm. And the way that that translates in missions is that uh, you kind of have a puristic uh, uh, view toward the, the cultures of the world. Uh, whereas what we teach is that, uh, you know, cultures are part God's diversity, but also part man's perversity. Mm. So, uh, that's just one uh, small example of of a concept that we kind of try to uh, to advocate in biblical missiology is trying to help people to get back to the Bible and missions yeah. and uh, and really be able to integrate this uh, biblical worldview with uh, a mission yeah. I'm, I'm smiling and laughing here because you're describing the entire premise of our show uh, to help thinkers go and <laughs> go awesome. think you, you, we're trying to bridge this uh, great gulf fixed between uh, biblical theology um, sound doctrine 
and missiology. Well, that is so encouraging to just find kindred spirit. Well, uh, and I'll give you an example of this too, to back up what you're saying for our listeners. Uh, many of you know, Brooks Buser, a friend of the show, uh, you just heard him share about Radius International during the commercial break, uh, was eviscerated over the weekend on Twitter. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For reporting um, the, mm-hmm. that they were able, praise God, to send some missionaries to the Amdu people. Um, who I take to be in the Papua New Guinea islands, you know, region. I'm not mm-hmm. sure where precisely I, I could be wrong, uh, but it's a remote tribal uh, people and sharing, you know, on Twitter saying, Hey, we sent our team, praise God. Um, for the first time, there are people of this unreached people group who've been reconciled to God and uh, just describing what that looks like. And uh, I mean, it, it seems as though every, every secularist just came out of the woodwork and, and, and dogpiled on the poor guy. Um, on Twitter, uh, is, I wish you would get COVID, you know, go home. I mean, cursing at everything you could imagine. <laughs> um, but, but it is because um, that, first of all, our, our culture is so hostile to the idea of doing anything in the way of proselytization, but it's because of that anthropological mm-hmm presupposition that man is basically good and, you know, sort of leave the noble savage alone sort of a thing. Um, don't, exactly. don't affect these the other noble cultures. noble savage was the exact word I was just thinking of. Right, yeah. right. And, and within the rest of missiology, you have these trends that are saying, um, you know, to pull from social movement theory and to pull from all of these other sociological categories um, to get your biblical methodologies rather than just starting straight from the text of scripture. I know, it's, I know it's a little off topic, but just the ridiculousness of saying, you know, that some of these uh, tribal people, you know, who are could, who could be cannibalistic, who could be, you know, taking advantage of their children sexually. I mean, all sorts of horrible things go on in some of these places, too. Not to say they're all that way, right. but but to act like, you know, we should just leave them completely alone because they're so happy in their life. And you, you when you actually talk to to Christians that come out of that that background, even though they're still living in the tribes, um, their lives aren't as happy as what these, you know, cushy, rich Western secularists are like, like to imagine, you know, it's, an, <laughs> it's a false, it's a false uh, fantasy that goes on in their heads. But absolutely. And I think that same fantasy has come out of uh, the, you know, the anthropological community. And even if you look at, you know, for example, National Geographic, yeah, uh, yes. you see within the lines of that beautiful gold frame, they want to find the most exotic. And it's really an exoticism mm. that uh, that yeah. really romanticizes that the Western society really likes the romanticization of of the noble savage that is pure. And, you know, he was he was really doing fine until Western culture yeah. uh, kind of like polluted him yeah, and that's yeah. when sin really happened so yeah in a way the anthropological and by western culture it usually means christendom mm-hmm. i mean yeah. that's usually yeah, a euphemism exactly. yeah. yeah so in the anthropological bible the fall of man was really the westernization mm. well e- well even in america like certainly there was atrocities against native american people yeah. for sure but you know the myth that when the Westerners came, that's when disease was spread. Well, there was a disease mm-hmm. that was spreading all over the new world way before, you know, they're, they're, they're not virus free simply because, you know, I mean, the average lifespan of some of these peoples was, was 40 years old, you know, it, it mm-hmm. isn't as if everyone's living to a hundred years old, then the Westerners came and everyone died, you know, it's bad history. For sure. And I think honestly, as a global community, we're moving beyond the time when we really need to think of uh, missions as a Western activity because really the global church we're talking about the the global south and we're talking about how missions is really from everywhere to everywhere so i think we as a body of christ need to move on beyond those things but unfortunately you know and one of the reasons why biblical missiology has to exist is to help us to move beyond that old pendulum swing like you were talking about the the trenches on either side you either fall in in the trench of colonization and thinking that the West is the best and things like that. Or on the other side, you think that these, uh, these, uh, noble savages are totally fine. And, and there's a little bit of cognitive dissonance with your beliefs that the gospel must go out and everybody has to believe in Jesus, but then that they're also basically all right. And that's where you get the insider movement ideas where it's like, let's leave them Muslims, but we just try to insert a little Jesus in there somewhere that's why we come to that conclusion. But if we have a more biblically uh, rooted and also a more uh, globally diverse 
nuanced understanding of what missions is and that it's not a Western activity, then I think uh, the global church can move on to more healthy uh, ways of thinking about missions. So I want to ask you a question about Islam and Muslims. When when we worked with a Muslim people group, you know, it was, it was interesting. We get into discussions, especially, and eventually it would come to something about Islam. And even if I were to bring out some, some issue with, uh, with something that said in the Quran, the response was always, um, or often, well, you know, I don't speak Arabic, you don't speak Arabic. So who, who's to know, unless we speak Arabic, we're never really going to understand. Well, here you mm-hmm. are a Christian from a Christian background, your family's Christian. Yeah, what do you know? And yet, and yet you speak Arabic uh, mm-hmm. and um, and you're living in that Middle Eastern, very mixed uh, uh, society of Christians and Muslims and Druze and other peoples. Um, what you know, what do you think that a lot of of Western missiology is getting wrong about Islam and, and how to reach Muslims with the gospel? Sure. I think, well, one of one of the uh, the misconceptions you could say about Islam is that it's that it's monolithic and that there is a purist version of it. And what I would like to say about that is how are you going to find the true version of a false religion? And, and what's that going to help you anyway? So uh, when a lot of people are saying, no, Islam is this, no, Islam is that, no, Islam is the religion of peace. No, Islam is a religion of violence. And what I would say is that really the real Islam is whatever is in the head of a Muslim. <laughs> Any given Muslim believes one thing or the other. And that, you know, from a person that, you know, I'm evangelistically uh, oriented. I want to know how do I share the gospel with Muslims? I'm not interested in looking back through history only to find out what Islam used to be. Although I have studied a lot, you know, about the history of Islam. There's a lot of fascinating insights you can get out of that. But for example, if I look at the history of a word and the etymology of a word, that's not necessarily all I need to know about that word. What I really need to know about the word is what does it mean today when I say it? Um, so uh, so there's, a, there's a difference between the history and the present. But basically, whatever a Muslim thinks that Islam is, I try to meet them there. And if they're a moderate Islam, and they have a value of, you know, they think that Islam is love, you know, as you, some people on social media will say, That's as what I historically say. ridiculous <laughs> as that is, and I just need to take them where they are. And I say, okay, you know what, if you believe that God is love, then I want to introduce you to the God of love. And hmm. I want to introduce you to Jesus. Yeah. And I want to tell you about how Jesus loved people. And from there, people are either going to see the light or not, but I don't want to get engaged in a debate on what is the true version of a false religion. Mm. That's a helpful perspective. So, and I think it goes back to this thing of what is the role of apologetics and do you need to study all of the different forms of counterfeits Mm -hmm. or do you just need to know what the original um, true thing is, right? And that's a theme that we've come back to on this show multiple times. So for you, uh, for someone in your situation, somebody that wants to go deep engaging Muslims with the gospel, what texts of scripture should someone master if they want to go deep dive with Muslims in evangelistic conversations? What would equip them from scripture that they should study and know well and immerse themselves in from your perspective? You know, I think you need to master the whole scripture. There you go. That's a good answer. I really believe that you need to integrate the scripture into your being because Jesus is the word of God. And when he was walking on this earth, he was the word of God. And any question that somebody asks of him, the word is going to just flow out of him because he's Mm -hmm. the word of God. And we need to be that incarnation of the word of God. And so I think the Western, um, you know, I think the Western mind kind of says, well, I want the quick tips. I want the top 10 most, uh, you know, if we're going to make a nice blog post, we're going to say top seven scriptures to know to, to, you know, to get a Muslim to believe in Jesus. And I just think you that, won't believe what this apologist said next. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, so, so for me, I think you need to master one thing you need to master is the, the symbols that are in the, in the Bible and the stories that are in the Bible. Because um, when you are able to take out of a, a meal that you're eating with a Muslim, 
uh, just start telling them a story or a parable um, because you want to tell them something. Uh, so I think the Western mind, when you want to tell somebody something, you just tell it to them as an abstract truth. And then, you know, there could be a discussion or debate. But I think the, the Eastern mind, when you want to tell them something, you, you leave that something in your mind and you think of a story that you could tell them to get your point across in a in an implied way in an in an indirect way sometimes and then and actually it becomes very clear what you're trying to say because but it's powerful because it's a story and that's what you see Jesus doing so it's a it's a little bit silly sometimes in missions where we take a middle eastern scripture this is something that drives mm. me crazy as a middle eastern person you take a middle eastern <laughs> scripture and you systematize it and you tag it by topic and you ring it out to four spiritual laws or threes of this or ABC one, two, three in a Western time. And then you figure out how do we contextualize these abstract principles <laughs> <laughs> for the Middle Eastern audience. And I'm like, brother, uh. <laughs> just <laughs> go back to the Bible because it's already contextualized for the Middle East, because it is a Middle Eastern text for Middle Eastern people. Man, you, are you just trying to tick us all off and hurt our feelings? Come on now. Let's see what he's doing. He he brings <laughs> us in. He you know he starts whooping on I sociology, know. and then he gives us the left hook <laughs> like that. And, you know, but I think something we good. can all agree really on good. for sure. Yeah, is is that um, you know Scripture not only gives us the right. Um, answers to certain questions, right? How can I be saved or how can I be justified? Those sorts of um, abstract propositional truth types of questions. Scripture also gives us the right types of questions to be asking. And that, that I think provides the, um, the guardrails on sort of what you're saying. Amen. Because we don't want to also let the host culture of the missionary determine all of the questions. So I've heard conversations with missiologists, you know, asking, well, this this particular tribal culture isn't asking any questions about justification or the afterlife or anything. They care entirely what to do with disease and spirits. And so we should just let the text of Scripture answer those questions. Um, for sure, we should let Scripture speak to those things. But also, where does the majority of the text of Scripture camp out? It, it forces us to start asking questions that we may not have been asking prior prior to that, like, how can I be saved or, uh, how can I join the kingdom of God? Right. So it, mm. it leads us to the right questions and it gives us the right answers. And I think whether we're Western or Middle Eastern, whatever context we're coming from, we often want to bring our own agendas to the text and we have to let the text of scripture be the text of scripture. And you're right for somebody with an Eastern mind, <laughs> they're, they're going to wrap their mind around at least the words of Christ a lot more easily. Uh, whereas maybe we'll gravitate more towards Paul, but it's all God's truth. It's all, uh, equally inspired and it's all profitable and it's all useful if we let it say what it says. Yeah. And I, I think what you're getting, I think one thing that inspires me about what you're saying is um, I think that contextualization sometimes is mischaracterized as trying to make it not just easier to communicate about the truth of the gospel, but also easier to accept. And I would say yeah. it's kind of like somebody mistaking archaeology for excavation. And how, what do I mean by that? Is that the gospel is a stumbling block. So what we're trying to do is we're Amen. not trying to steamroll that stumbling block so that people don't stumble on it anymore. What we're trying to do is clear out the dust and the dirt and the sand away from that stumbling block so that people won't stumble on the other stuff. They mm. should stumble on the gospel. So what it means is that the, the, the word of God, is a, it's a sharp double-edged sword and it's a stumbling block for for Jews, and it's a and it's foolishness to the Gentiles. Mm. So what we need to do is clarify that sharp edge, not be dulling it down. the The point is not to clear away the stumbling block. The point is to clear away what are the obstacles to that stumbling block, so that every soul can come up against the the power of the gospel, and either reject it, which many will, or understand it and accept it. Well, thank you so much for all of that insight. And I would love to be able to come back to some of these discussions. And I, I'm glad that you're at least in the States for a little while, even though I'm sure you'd rather be back in Beirut at <laughs> some point soon. How, how long will you still be in the States? You know, we're you know? planning to head back September 6th, my family and I, my wife and three kids. 
And if we're able to do that, we're going to do it. Uh, we're also aware that uh, a month in 2020 can yeah. change everything. Oh man! But whether I'm in the U.S. or Lebanon, I would be honored uh, to continue uh, having discussions with you uh, on your podcast. And I'm, you know, I'm available also, uh, you know, for that online. So, so how can people get a hold of you? How can they find out more of your work? We've talked about uh, a little bit of your writing, but you can you tell us again, like, how can they find you? How can they get access some of the things you've written and how can they give if they want to be able to, to get involved with giving to helping these churches and the ministries that are yeah. going on in Beirut right now, even relieving some of these, uh, these pains that are there. Sure. Well, I think biblical is wonderful in terms of the, the written material. Um, but yeah, in terms of, uh, finding about the, the field ministry that we're doing, um, and also being able to help with the Lebanon crisis, which is truly, you know, an, a, an incredibly urgent need. They can find that at horizonsinternational.org and, uh, right on the front page, there will be something called the Lebanon crisis fund. And so if you click there, you'll find information about what we're doing, um, through kind of our, our network of staff and, uh, and partner churches there. And the needs are just uh, are, are just so great right now. So we'd appreciate your prayers and, you know, and everybody's support for that. Thank you so much for your time today, Pierre. And go ahead, everybody, look up Horizons International, look up biblicalmissiology.org, do everything you can to pray for the church in Beirut, pray for the situation in Lebanon, pray that God uses it for the spread of the gospel. And we look forward to continuing to have these conversations about bridging the gap between missiology and between uh, the simple truths of, uh, of sound doctrine from scripture. So Pierre, thank you so much. Thank you, Alex. And thank you, Scott. To get more content, go to missionspodcast.com or check out abwe.org slash podcast. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, rate, review, and share. To ask a question or suggest a topic, email alex at missionspodcast.com, and we'll see you next time on the Missions Podcast.